Uh, hello everybody, welcome to Stump Cross Caverns. Uh, my name's John, Dr. John, I'm a geologist and a caver, so I'll tell you a little bit about Stump Cross Caverns just before your visit into the cave. Now, first of all, I have to do a little bit of HSE, which is that you will need to wear a helmet. The top of the stairs that are just to my right here, there are baskets you won't be able to see them from here but when you get down the first set of stairs you'll see them uh, at that point you will need to put one of the helmets on um, the white helmets are for adults the children's helmets we've got lots of colors um, there's little blue ones that make you look like bob the builder and there's all kinds of stuff there so just choose one that fits you that doesn't go over your eyes and they'll protect your head Whatever size you are, you need to wear one because if you bang your head, it will hurt, uh, however small you are. So the other thing is, is that periodically, if there's a little bit of water in there, we'll put Wellington boots at the top of the stairs. There aren't any for most of the year, but if you do come and you see the wellies there, then just grab a pair that are your right size and correct size, and then just go into the cave wearing them. So then you go down the steps now. You're going to guide yourself around the cave and this I'll give you one of these surveys to take with you. The entrance is down here which is where the steps are. Um, the easiest way to navigate around the cave is just to keep left. So you go left at the bottom of the stairs, you go left into Wolverine Cave, then you turn around come back again and go left along the main passage. You then go left into Reindeer Cavern turn around come back again and go left into the cathedral and then finally you turn around come back and go left and left again and it'll bring you back out of the entrance which is in fact also the exit for that reason you will encounter people going in the opposite direction to you if you would just pass where it's wide enough to pass don't squeeze past in the narrow sections the narrower sections have plenty of room for one person to go along but you wouldn't want two people going in opposite directions at the same time. So just wait, let them come through, or they may wait for you and then go through. The other main thing in the cave is that the cave's a very delicate environment. Please don't touch the formations. I know it looks like just another piece of stone, but in fact, there's lots of little micropores in the surface, as there are in your fingers, and when you touch it, a little bit of skin and oil from your fingers rubs into the formation. And no matter how hard we try and clean them, we will never get it back out again. So you do spoil them over a long period of time. So please don't touch them. And most importantly, the cave formations have taken thousands, tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of years to form. Never break a cave formation as it will not repair for many, many, many generations, probably more than you can even imagine. So never break formations. Right, so that's all the sort of HSE side of things. Now what I'll do is I'll tell you a little bit about the geology. So the rock in which the cave is formed is this, it's limestone. It's carboniferous limestone. It's absolutely packed full of fossils. In this case, it's crinoids, which were like sea lilies that lived on the sea floor. Uh, but also there are brachiopods that look a little bit like bivalves. Um, there are other things such as corals. We get absolutely loads of corals within the rock. So the sea that this was laid down in would have resembled something like the Bahamas or Bermuda, beautiful, uh, shallow calcareous um, mudstone sea however the different the big difference would have been there wouldn't have been all the fishes because the backbone fishes as we know them did not exist 350 million years ago they hadn't evolved and for the children just to let you know this is rock is much older than the dinosaurs so there's no dinosaurs in there either so I'm afraid you won't see any of those in the cave so that's the formation of the limestone. Now limestone, as I say, it's carboniferous limestone. It formed when this region was closer to the equator, uh, but uh, continental drift has now brought this area much further north to where we are now. 
limestone. There's lots of it around in the Yorkshire Dales. I'm sure many people will know um, Malham Cove, Gordale Scar, Kilnsey Crag, places like that. They're all made of limestone because it's a hard rock. We even have limestone in the car park as a, as a material for, for driving over because it's so hard. But limestone has a major weakness. The weakness of this limestone is that water, if it's ever so slightly acidic over long periods of geological time, is capable of dissolving its way through the rock. And the reason that the water is slightly acidic is when it falls through the sky, it picks up a percentage of carbon dioxide, so it actually becomes a very mild carbonic acid. And in addition to that, if the water flows through the peat that we've got, the soil that there is up here in the dales, then it picks up organic acids. So basically it's a very mild acid. Not so you'd ever notice it, you can still drink a lot of the back water, um, it's perfectly, it, 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 you won't feel that it's acidic but geological time allows it to actually dissolve its way through the solid rock. So that's how the cave system forms. Now, I've shown you the diagram of the, of the tourist part of the cave system. If you look up here, then what we have is a survey of the entire Stump Cross system. The entire Stump Cross cave system is 6.3 kilometers long and the piece that you do as a tourist is a half, half of what's coloured in red in this bottom left hand corner. So you really only do a very small proportion of the cave system. There are lots of other cave systems in the Yorkshire Dale, probably, well, you could say hundreds in fact. Uh, this is just one of many, but the thing that's special about Stump Cross is it's very accessible. We're close to the road, it's not too far underground um, and it's got beautiful formations and it's equipped for tourists to visit. So there are staircases, handrails, lights, you can get helmets. Obviously there's a whole cafe structure here at the entrance as well for, um, for refreshments before or after going into the cave. So that's what makes Stump Cross particularly special. The two other shore caves uh, in the Yorkshire Dales are under Ingleborough, right at the other side of the Yorkshire Dales National Park. So this is the most accessible one uh, in the bottom south east corner of the Yorkshire Dales. So the water that formed this cave has in fact now created a system much deeper down. Uh, and you could see it, you could just see it on the survey, the blue lines on the survey are the sections that are full of water they're accessible only to cavers or to divers in fact so we you don't go anywhere near that you don't see a stream or you don't hear a stream as you go through the cave passage um, so once the water had abandoned these higher level passages then any further water that percolates through uh, percolates through the rock that's carrying dissolved limestone in it when it comes across these voids that have been created earlier on, then it will deposit some of that dissolved limestone as the mineral calcite. And when you're in the cave, everything you see, all the formations are made up of this mineral calcite, which is calcium carbonate. Um, if it comes from the roof, then uh, it'll form stalactites. So this is, a, this is a stalactite that had to be removed at one point. So it'll form a stalactite in the roof. If the water drops to the floor, it'll form a stalagmite. And when the two join, you get columns. Uh, if it flows over the rock, you will get flow, what we call flowstone. You get gower pools, where little ponded, little ponded pools of almost static water are, um, and so, or curtains. And in fact, what we have here are some old postcards from Stump Cross Caverns and they show the formations. And even though the black and white photographs were taken in the 1950s, the formations are almost identical. Uh, the growth is so slow that you really can't tell the difference. But so, so that's the origin of, of the formations. So I've covered, I've covered the origin of the formations and the origin of the cave very, very briefly, I might add. Um, the, in, to move into more recent time, the caves were discovered 
1860 by two brothers, two miners from Derbyshire who'd moved into the area because the wages and conditions were better. Greenhow, difficult to imagine now, the nearest village was a mining village. Um, from the 1700s and 1800s, that was the main activity in this area. But we do have evidence that even the Romans were mining lead up here. So the history of mining lead goes back a long way. What they're looking for was this, and this is galena, it's lead sulfide. It's very heavy, very dense mineral, as you would expect for a lead ore. Uh, when it's smelted, it gives off sulfur dioxide uh, and you get left, left with, with a nice malleable uh, uh, material, metal, that you can work quite easily. Now in the past, lead was used a lot for water pipes, for cisterns, because it was easy to work, easy to make watertight. It was used for toy soldiers, for children, it was used for paint. And obviously, initially, it was even used in petrol because it stopped uh, combustion engines from knocking. Obviously, since then, we've realized that low quantities of lead are actually particularly bad for us, so it isn't used as much. However, it's still used for shielding against radioactivity, um, and also it's used for lead acid batteries for storing electricity. So as we move over to electricity, there is still a market for lead. However, what happened here was the price dropped and the industry uh, disappeared. But the two brothers were ahead of this because when they discovered the cave, they were clever enough to realize that they could develop it as a tourist attraction. So from 1862, they were leading people through the caves. Now, the people would have actually come to what used to be a pub at the bottom of the hill below Stump Cross. There was no building here. They would then get changed uh, out of the, the uh, crinolines and the, the finery because it tended to be Sunday outings or summer outings. Uh, they would then put on canvas boiler suits and the miner would march them up the roadside. They were all given a candle and then the miner would lead them underground with a lantern. Um, so um, I think you'll find that the lighting system nowadays in the caves is a lot more advanced than that. Yeah, it's much more powerful than just a single light lantern. Interesting fact is that we found uh, advertising for these people. Uh, for these visits to the cave and they were charged one shilling a head um, which uh, is a substantial well was a substantial amount of money it would be much closer to us charging you like 50 or 60 pounds a head to go down the cave so so uh, so it's good value nowadays um, the people would have arrived by horse-drawn omnibus from the railway stations at Grassington or at Pateley Bridge which no longer exist so it was, a, it was a big adventure, and obviously only for the, for the slightly wealthy. Uh, I mean, really, the nouveau riche, as we'd refer to them, uh, the mill owners and the people, the middle class folk that were developing within the middle Victorian era. To go back to the survey, the thing is, the miners would have taken you through here, but they would not have taken you through Wolverine and Reindeer. Now, the reason for that is to access those sections, you had to crawl. Um, and we found that the majority of tourists are not really attracted to caves to go crawling through small, tight sections. So what happened in the 1980s and the 1990s, the then owner of the caves uh, dug these trenches out to allow you just to walk through. And as you go through into Wolverine, at shoulder height, you can see the little passage that used to be the access to the, to, the, to the attractive chambers at the end. Um, so, fortuitously, when they uh, dug these trenches, they discovered the remains of 10 individual uh, wolverines in this section and four reindeer in this section. Not complete, they were all disarticulated, in other words, separated. Uh, but the bones had got washed in, so they didn't live in the caves. They obviously lived close to the entrances. They have been dated to about 85, 86,000 years ago, which situates them somewhere at the end of the last interglacial period, so prior to the last ice advance. These creatures, uh, reindeer, I'm sure you all know what they are. Wolverines live in the same environment. They're the largest member of the stoat and the weasel family. They're like a giant badger. Uh, they still live up in the tundra environment of northern Canada and northern Russia. Um, so obviously the climate here 86,000 years ago 
was, uh, was that of northern Canada and northern Russia. It was a tundra environment. Wolverines tend to be scavengers, principally on the remains of dead reindeer. Uh, they will hunt, but, uh, but so they're not just on X-Men, um, in fact. Right, uh, right, the next thing I need to tell you is when you go underground, I'll, get, I'll lend you a little torch. There are plenty of lights. Uh, however, people sometimes want to look in the places that are not brightly lit. Uh, obviously, don't go down the side passages um, or else you will get very, very dirty and very, very lost. But uh, So, I'll lend you one of those. In addition to that, we have two quizzes that you can do. Uh, one is looking for little fairy doors right at floor level and little fairy houses. And then we've got a fossil and mineral quiz as well. If, you, if the children, it's only open to children I'm afraid, uh, but if the children do these and get more than 8 out of 10, then they get a prize when they come out. And in addition, if anyone is, if any of them are looking for the fairy doors, then we give them a little finger torch, whoops, which they can then take home afterwards. So that's a little souvenir that children can, can play with in the cave whilst they're looking for fairies and then take them home at the end of the day. Uh, if you are, you are here after three o'clock in the afternoon currently, sometimes it's only in evenings, we do something rather special which no other show cave does, which is to turn the principal lights off and just leave the emergency lights on. And then we allow you to take one of these torches, these are UV torches, ultraviolet, and to go and light the cave with these ultraviolet torches. Now the interesting thing, which you can't see on the surface, is that calcite will fluoresce. So when you light up the formations, they, they light up in a really bright sort of yellowy green color sometimes almost, but that's what happens to the calcite. So that we believe that's the only experience uh, in the UK where you can actually light the caves up with UV. So, and the only, the only other thing to mention is that if you feel you didn't get enough information from me, then what you can do when you arrive at the cave is you can buy our guidebook, which is £2, which gives you information, uh, a little bit more detail and obviously some more pretty pictures to look at. Um, and there is even on YouTube, there is a video that lasts 17 minutes, which is introductory and uh, to Stump Cross and also about limestone formation and about uh, cave formation. Um, so I would recommend you watch that because obviously on a video, then you can actually see pictures of sea, tropical seas as we imagine them um, and the limestone itself. And I think that's all. And we look forward to welcoming you here at Stump Cross Caverns.